Obviously, you like trains. How did you get involved in trains in the first place? Oh, gee, I, as years went on, I got more interested. Well, did you have a train as you were a small kid or what? Oh, yes. What'd you have? That Lionel. Okay. You got that? How old were you when you got the train? Three. Three years old. Jeez. Yes. And then things uh, kept galloping from there. I built a couple of small train layouts, but they weren't as satisfying as getting something bigger. <laughs> so as years went on, things grew until you see what you have here. Now, have you always lived here? Have your family? No. Okay. Uh, I've had the property since 59 or 60. Okay. And I moved here permanently in 1972. Yeah, along with my folks. And uh, it's been an interesting venture. Well, we're going to tap into that today at some point. Now, yes. Todd, what point did you get involved with Roy and the, and the put trains here? Uh, probably back in about 1997. That's for uh, you in the construction business or something? Or yeah, I do drywall. Okay. 97? Uh, 1997. Okay. And uh, that's when I basically met Roy, and we uh, started hitting it off and talking about trains, and then I got more interested in it. And it just snowballed from there. Uh, he had his tracks all tore up, and I thought, well, let's do something with it. Now you say tracks, the ones we have today? Uh, yes. Now, where did, these, where did you get tracks like this for your train? People, they make this just for trains? These big oh, tracks? yes. Uh, this is what they call 12-pound rail. It's 12 pounds for three feet. It's two inches high, a two-inch wide base, and a one-inch wide head. And uh, I bought, the first batch I bought was 14 ton at 13 cents a pound. You won't buy it for that today. Now, how far did you have to go to get this track? to get it back here to northern Minnesota? Well, this was at a time I lived in Chicago, and I bought it from Castle Steel on the south side of Chicago. And a friend of mine hauled it and all the ties up here in his semi-truck. Oh yeah, the ties, okay. They're not standard, what are they, four by four ties? Yes. Treated wood, because it lasted yes. quite a while. Oh yes. Okay. Uh, you may as well not get involved with a project unless it's been treated somehow. Otherwise, they'll rot out from under. Okay. Now, you got the tracks. And then where did the engines come from? Did you make them? Somebody make them or custom made or what? The first engine to run here was what they called an Ottawa. And uh, it had five cars of which right now as we speak there's a new boiler being constructed for that little Ottawa. And uh, I hope any day now to be able to pick that boiler up. And needless to say it has my favorite little engine because it's the first one I ran with. Now you say first one, how many engines do you have? How many trains do you have here? Uh, let's see. <laughs> That'll be the fifth one. Are they all, all in as good a shape as the one you have sitting here? Oh yes. They all they all produce fire and steam and yes. Wow. Well, we'll see that later on. That later off operation later. How many acres are you utilizing for your tracks going around here? You got a big track layout. Well, it's a half mile long. The track is a half mile long? Yes. Holy minnow buckets. Yes. Well, you, well, how many acres would you say it covers? 20? I'd say at least 20 acres. Okay. Now, Todd, were you part of laying the track, or is that something you... Um, the original track was down, and he uh, ripped a bunch of it up, and it sat for a long time, many years. And when I met him, there were trees about four inch in diameter that was growing up through the tracks. Okay. So it was sitting for a while. 
Uh, so we got into it and started ripping the trees out of there and dragging track in, laying out the uh, ground. And what you see now, today is... Now when you started laying track, did you have some kind of jig to get the spacing perfect? Yes. Put down and then nail it down from there? Yes. Did you have to hammer by hand or did you have a little machine? Oh, yes. By hand. Oh, by hand. Okay. That's a lot of... A lot of real, what do you call them? Tie, tin, tie nails or what are you? Spikes. Spikes. Yeah. They're known. Uh, two years ago, I put down 400 and some ties by myself. These are new. Now, did you, did you have something to lift the track up when you yes, did it? Yes. Yes. It's a machine that uh, you drag along on the tracks, it rolls on the tracks, and there's two arms that go underneath and lifts the tie up against the rail. And you, uh, they're pre drilled, you throw them a little oil, and you pound the spikes in, and you move to the next one. You mean the hole where the spike goes yeah. is oiled? Yes. Why? Uh, to help it out uh, from rotting and uh, uh, they go in a lot. Of they go in easier that way? How long is the spike going into the 4x4? Four four? Two inch. Yeah. Two inches. Now, putting oil in the hole before you put the spike in yeah. helps keep the rust down on the spike and preserve sure it the wood? Yeah. Yes. Okay, never heard of that before. Yes. Oh, all right. All right. Now, what, what's your measuring stick to decide when it's time to change a, t a tie? Just the looks of it, or is it get spongy? Uh, you can tell if they're getting rotten. Now, these ties here might look bad, but they're still solid. And I can't see throwing away a tie if it's doing its job. Okay. We have here is a uh, railroad tie installer. Um, plus, it uh, guy, uh, sets the track at uh, 12 and 1 8 at the same time. And uh, what we'll do is I'll back it up. I'll back this one up here from the desk. in place and what these do here on each side is, is set the track at 12 and 1 8. This is the shoe that I'll set the railroad tie on and what, what I'll do is I'll crank it up you set the tie in place you crank it up tight. That pulls the tie up against the base of the rails. So when you pound the spikes in, it won't move on you. You place the spike in. Each side like that. We'll start with this one over here. That's one. That's that's another. Then what we do is we release, back it out, and we're set to go to the next one. And that's how it. That this is how it is done. This uh, machine, uh, Roy Hagstrom built it back in uh, the 70s. Um, he designed it and uh, it works great. So the whole thing rolls on ball bearing, or roller bearing, I should say. And it weighs probably about 250 pounds. Behind us, we have a big flat roof, which is a, I think, a terrific sign from the road. You don't need another sign. That's your sign. It's your logo. Is that your depot or? Yes. Okay. The station. The station. All right. 
what keeps the wind from blowing this roof off? Because it's just sitting on telephone poles. Look at its yeah. construction. Yeah, there's no walls. It blows right through. Okay. Yeah, it's got yes. a um, it's got a flat top uh, with a, a water barrier on top and then rock on top. Oh, you got some weight there then. Yeah. Oh yes. And that's sitting just on those I call telephone poles. Yeah. That's <laughs> what they were. <laughs> now you have some diagonal poles. Is that to add for a movement or yes. keep it yes. moved? Okay. Well, I would, I would have thought the wind would have picked it up like a parachute and put it over in the neighbor's yard or something. Uh -huh. A few times we've been concerned about that. <laughs> but then uh, it stayed right where you're seeing it. Well, how long has the roof been up? Here, Since 1980. The new road was finished up in 87. Okay. Right around that time. Okay. You picked up a new engine this year, you said, or something, something said? Yes, this, this one, one here. right here. Oh, okay. And does it, does, it, does it have a name, like a type engine, or? Uh, the number seven. Number seven, is there yep. a type to it, like a type name? Uh, the early American. Now, the other engines you have have a distinct name. Yes. What are they? Uh, the big one is a 4664, uh, 5100 class Z6. And that was uh, a copy of the Northern Pacific engine of that type. It's in the Challenger class. <clears throat> then there's the uh, Hiawatha, which is in the Hudson class, which is a 464 that used to be the racehorse for the Milwaukee Road on their passenger trains. Where do they get these class names? Like the Navy has these kind of names too, yes. such and such class. So small engines have a class name? Well, this is the early American. Okay. I uh, thought you had an engine inside that had a Pacific name or something like that. What was that called? Well, the uh, Hiawatha is Hiawatha. a 464. Yeah. It's okay. a Hudson, what they call a Hudson. Now, who's they? Well, Railroad. through the railroad industry, okay. certain wheel configurations got named things. So the name then comes from the railroad industry after big trains? Yes, sir. Okay, so if you know your trains, no matter what size it is, if they say it's such and such class, you yes. have an idea of what it is. Yeah. Okay. And the Z6 is a Northern Pacific. Okay. Now, when we look at this, camera goes over to it. I'm looking at a big cylinder and then a smaller cylinder in front. Why two different sizes? You have a small cylinder here and you have a big one over there. This, this part here. Oh, what you're touching. Oh, that's the smoke box. This oh. part here. Okay. From here over to here is your boiler. And your firebox on this one here then uh, runs on a wood, a wood fire? Yes. In there? Yes. Yeah. Live steam. How we're staying with wood because it's a nice controllable fire. As compared to coal. coal. Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting comment. What's why can't you or why is how I, I how do you explain the wood's controllable? You're talking about temperature now? Yes. And coal does what? You're using coal and it once it really starts to burn. You're dealing with some severe heat. And when you close the throttle, the heat doesn't always calm down. Oh. And the man who built these engines thought, why subject the boilers to that severe heat? So he backed up and went to oak. And he found that's what he was going to burn in them. More control of the oak. That's hot yes. too. Yeah. Oak burns hot. Oh yes. But when you back off the throttle, it calms down quicker. You don't have that continued severe heat in that firebox. It's like shutting the draft off on a uh, wood stove. Yep. And you you have a, you have to watch your pressure gauge. You don't get too much steam. And That's yeah. right. Is there a safety valve? The steam yes. can pop out someplace? Yes. Yep. Uh, on the top here. Right here. Okay. And this is the whistle. 
Okay. Valve. Okay, we'll get shots of that in a minute. Uh, the other trains that you have, then everything's the same principle, just a different look. Yes. Yes. Now, I see you got a pile of wood in the back and so forth. Do you have cars you can attach to this so somebody can ride on this train? Yes. They're under the station roof. Okay, you got cars in there you can hook on. Yep. Yes. And people sit on it like you sit on a horse or something? No, just like you're sitting on that chair. Sideways, you mean? No, right. No, right like feet that. Right oh, you got, you got feet are inside? Yep. Yes. Okay, and how many cars can you pull with this? Two, three? We have never pushed them to their limit. But on an average day, if somebody wants to come in and make a donation for maintenance yeah. and go for a ride, what would you accommodate? Five, six people at the most? Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And they go they go through the whole track system all the way around. Yes. And back again. Well, that sounds pretty exciting. And sometimes twice or three times, oh, if yeah. they want to go. That's seven. Why you change it over to this? You'll notice there's a different name on the side. Uh, somebody wanted their picture along with their kids, and they were familiar with an engine that he built called the Crooks. First locomotive in the state of Minnesota. But this one started out as number seven. Well, it's got many, many miles on it. Uh, as a big one. So he made number seven. Well, we're going to change it back to number seven. And when this boiler was built, you can't supposedly take it to another state. It's a Minnesota boiler. It's a special boiler. And it, it's a number, it was number seven of the Minnesota boilers built for miniatures. And, uh, it's very interesting to find out the history on a lot of these. So, oh, maybe I should give him a hand here. No, I'm all right. Okay, so you sit on the boards and your feet are inside. Yep. Yes. Now this caboose and these cars were built by the same man that made the engines. And who was that? Harry O. Johnson. From where? Minneapolis. So this was made in Minneapolis then? Yes. And he machined all the parts and so forth? Yes. Far even made wood patterns for the cylinders. This track is raised because our grade is up this high. Instead of cutting the grade down, we put the wood and blocks underneath and raise the rails, and inside the shop, we put a panel track in. Inside the shop, the rails are raised like you see them here, it makes it nice to work on the engines underneath. So you have to lay the tracks, open the door and lay the tracks so you can get inside. Yes. That's why it comes to an end, so you can get the door open. Yes. This is what is called the movable frog stub switch. And uh, I won't build another one. It's very functional, but I was under the gun when the new highway was put in to get something in place by the highway purchaser. So one set goes into the shop, the other set is a run through rail, and the third set is going to be the bypass track. Okay, throw the levers to see what happens. I'm almost standing on it. Yep. We are going from the uh, 
run through to the uh, shop. Give it a little momentum. This railroad started out as a 15 inch gauge, but then I acquired the 12 inch gauge out of a train, so those rails were put in. The 15 inch gauge train, I have all the parts for the engine, boiler, and six cars. Uh, they're all in the shop, and I'm trying to convert them down to 12 inch gauge because I don't think I'll live long enough to build a 15-inch gauge. That tie rod you see between the rails is connected to the sections of switch so that when it cools off, it doesn't just, this section doesn't just stay there. This section, when it would be cooling, would be pulling away from the switch, basic switch. So I put a tie rod in there to keep everything in adjustment. The spreader bars are three quarter inch threaded rod and we formed a, a, a clip for each end inside and outside the base of the rail so we can maintain our gauge because under heating and cooling Sometimes the rails will want to push the spikes out or bring the spikes in. This way, where we're having a little bit of a problem, you put the spreader bars in and the gauge stays. This engine weighs someplace between 14 and 1600 pounds. And our other two engines, the Hudson 464, weighs two and a half ton and the uh, freight engine, Northern Pacific 4664, weighs three and a half ton. We have put in all of this equipment and you can see the, the height that we've had to build things up to level the railroad out. And it seems like everything we do is a five minute job. <laughs> and it's all treated wood. This was put in many years ago with the intention of putting a coal tipple on top. A what? Coal tipple. What is that? That's where they, they load the tipple or container with coal and then the engines pull under them and fill their tenders with coal. And now it's just a what? That stainless hopper is the tipple bin itself. And right now this is just for display and it doesn't support anything? No. It, it will support plenty because of what, how it's built. This framework was put in before we raised the uh, roadbed. And uh, we're going to have to put more spacing on the top of this so that it's not too low when you drive under the coal tip. on this switch all winter because we wanted a passing track. 
So that's why this was put in, and this will go through the station area to the other switch by the shop so that we could use either one. And the switch itself, uh, it was a job to make all the parts. I took a left hand, a, a right hand turnout switch and made a left hand turnout switch. So we're now just fine tuning it because we don't want anything to go wrong when we're running. Now you had to make these steel parts? Yes. In your shop here? Yes. And what does the switch, a mechanical hand? Yes. On uh, those two ties that are sticking out over there, right. that's where the switch stand goes on. And we hope to have the, the switch stand working. Uh, we won't have the uh, switch lamps made yet, I don't think. Now we're trying to get it look, it's not exactly to scale, but uh, I think anyone looking at it that knows anything about trains will associate what we're doing with the big yep. ones. What year did the tornado go through Wadena? I don't know. I know one went through Gary, Minnesota. But I don't know one hit again. right here at 5.15 in the afternoon. That's why all these trees are gone. This used to be a forest. Oh. And one day Todd says, well, why don't we split the layout that's here and follow the tree line out there? So we added 800 more feet of rail to follow the tree line. And there was a little hill where this tunnel is and we were going to put in a little short tunnel for aesthetics. Well, instead, instead uh, we scrounged up stuff and we put in a 60-foot tunnel. And that's what's behind you here? Yes. Let's go take a look. Now, all the rocks that you see here, all of them, including those on each end of the tunnel, all came from the ground you're standing on. And when we finished putting this rock embankment in, neither one of us wanted to look at another <laughs> rock. How'd you make this tunnel? Well, we have a friend of ours that has a decent sized cap, and we dug out where you see the tunnel, just made a long trough. Then we picked up three 12,000 gallon burial fuel tanks, heavy ones. You just don't find those every day. How long did it take you to find those? Oh, I've got five more on the other side of the pond that there's <laughs> going to be a tunnel through them. Okay. A lot of people want to get rid of them. That, you take advantage of it. Uh, and we moved them ourselves, put them in here, bolted them together. How many cash tanks do you have here? Two or three? Three. Three, okay. Yes. And we thought we'll have one tunnel that we could lock. Uh, so we put doors in the end of it. Swing that door shut. That's got to be heavy, the top piece. Yeah, it's, it's all heavy material. I like working with heavy material. <laughs> and we use the ends of the tunnel for the door itself. So. Okay. Yes. And when they're, they haven't gotten painted yet, but that ridge, that shelf you see running around it, is going to be part of the dirt of the uh, rock work. We're going to put rock all on that edge.
Why am I looking at so many little wheels? What's happening here? This will hold a good yard and a half of fill. And that's an awful lot of weight, so we figured we'd better put two trucks under each end to take the weight. So this is the, the truck section we're looking at now then? Yes, the wheel sections. This item here we built by scratch. This what, what piece? This one here. This car. The, the whole car? Yep. Yes. This is from metal you had here at the place, or do you get the metal for this? Uh, the oh, bulk okay. of it I had here, but the side frame pieces I had to buy from the steel company. Okay, what do the handles do? Un unload the, drop the load on the tracks? Yeah. Or what? Yes. It opens a door in each bay. Now that's to put the rocks on the on the tracks, is that what it's for? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is a car from the little Ottawa train, which the new boiler is being made for. It's one of five cars, and it's a train set. The little Ottawa engine and the five cars are what you would call a train set. Uh, the little Ottawa train ran in the General Motors Park in Alexandria, Indiana. They went to a larger train, so this went to a dealer in Galva, Illinois. So I bought the, the whole train set from him and hauled it up here. That was the first train that ran here. How many years did you give rides here? About three years. And uh, then there's an important thing you do when you're in northern Minnesota, you get a, you make work or have a job. <laughs> So I went into business for myself here doing machining and welding and it treated me very well. Yeah, this is just a makeshift bridge I built for uh, the D6 cat to come over uh, so we can get on the other side and push dirt up on that tunnel and to landscape the other side over there too. Now those logs, those logs roll down right into the track? Yep, the, the railroad ties, I'll put them down in here so the cat don't ra uh, ride on the rail and bend it. Uh, we're going to head out of the tunnel here and head uh, north. And you'll see down through there uh, some rock, and we'll be going down to the north bend. And then we'll loop around and come back. Our water tank is another burial tank, a uh, heavy steel fuel oil tank that we stood up, put the wood on the outside, made our own spout, and it is a working model. Spout. Am I going to get wet? No. We could arrange that. I bet you could. <laughs> Counterweight on top here. Yep. To fill this tank, down in the pond we put a pump. 
because well water will ruin a boiler. So you should put in either river, creek, pond water, rain water. It's a softer water and doesn't have the contaminants in it that cook out, cook out and are left in a boiler. That eats up the steel? Uh, you could say yes, because the rust will start accumulating behind the silt and everything that collects in a boiler. This trestle was put in in about the year 2000, 2001. And uh, these rails used to be on ground level. But to bring it all up to the rest of the grade, we built this trestle underneath. And uh, it's all treated wood. And the verticals are tamarack. And that was treated. Uh, we don't want to have to start replacing this thing. <laughs> One day I was contacted by a neighbor and he said, come on over, I'll give you some scrap iron. Well, I went over there and his dad, many years ago, had this whole streetcar brought in on his property and he made a cabin out of it. Well, it slowly over the years rotted to nothing. And the man who had the property says, take it for the steel. Well, right off the bat, I could see a bridge. So uh, my friend and I, we got over there, got busy, and we hauled that steel streetcar frame over here as a future bridge. And that's uh, another thing in holding. <laughs> Now in the distance over there is, you can see the end of a barrel. There are five of them in a row that we're going to open up like our other tunnel. And uh, that'll be the second tunnel on the railroad. The four concrete pillars that you see are the footings for a future covered bridge. I have all the materials here. And uh, we just haven't had time to put it up and the railroad will go through a series of crossover frogs and go through that bridge to the woods on the other side and come back over the old, through that tunnel and over the streetcar bridge and back onto the main rails again. We think it'll make a nice, a nice run. Do you have any plans of when you want to open this to give out a few rides? Next year maybe or whatever? The sooner the better, but it's just not trimmed up. It's not park-like yet. Okay, you would like to make it look nice and clean and neat? And... Yes. Okay, so you've got now, are you, you going to work on this in the winter time also? Oh yes. Uh, if there's not if it's too cold outside, there's always a piece of equipment to work on inside. Is your shop heated then, or is it cold inside the shop? Uh, last winter, we emptied the engines because the winter before it took over four semis full of wood to heat that shop. It's not basically well insulated. <laughs> four semi loads so, of dirt, of, of wood? Yes. I'm just not. <laughs> so that was too too much. So we decided to drain the engines, 
because of all the water pipes and the crosshead pumps and the injectors, we didn't want one of those to split. How did you drain it? Did you put air pressure on it to blow it out or gravity? Some of the parts, yes. Otherwise, we take them off out and physically undo them and drain them. That sounds like it takes a while to do that. Oh, yes. But at the cost of one injector, they're $700 a piece now. And the injector does what? Puts the water into the boiler under pressure. Okay. Yeah, we'd like to introduce ourselves. I'm uh, Oliver Hardy, and this is Stan Laurel. Yep. <laughs> I wonder what kind of trouble we can get in over that. <laughs> A fellow from Oregon stopped in one time, and he asked if he could take pictures. He was from a newspaper in Oregon. And I says, yeah, go ahead, do that. And we explained to him, he says, well, how do these things work? We explained they're steam operated, burn wood, raise steam, boil water, raise steam. And well, when we got from in front of the place down to the water tank, he asked us, what kind of a motor do they have? He never been around trains before at all. No, he had not. But he got his pictures though, right? Yes. <clears throat> yes, and he, uh, when he asked what kind of motor does it have, I almost did a backflip. <laughs> <laughs> I would too. Now you, you, you're doing what now? You're, you need a torch to heat up the oil? Yeah, it's uh, called steam oil, and we put them in uh, this container and a container up here. And it's so thick, it's really hard for it to run. So you, you want to heat it up? You try to heat it up first. Hmm. Um, a guy by the name of Harry Johnson down in Ham Lake. Oh, really? Yep. He built this one, that one, and the one behind over there. Oh, my gosh. Yep. And he built quite a few others, too. But this was the top of the line stuff that he built. This one was built in 85. That one, I mean, 75. That one was built in 88. And that one there was built in... 1955. Wow. Uh, I'll get the fire door open here, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start the uh, fire. I'm gonna put the kindling in, and uh, try to get it rolling. Birch bark makes a good fire starter. It burns hot. Oh yes. Yep. Nature's kerosene. <laughs> Nature's kerosene? <laughs> And it takes a little over an hour to get them all prepped up for steam. Right.
And what I'm doing here is I got an air compressor hooked up to it, and that will be my uh, my draft inducer. Oh yeah. When it pumps up enough uh, <laughs> air. Yeah. What do you mean by draft inducer? Um, For the fire? Yeah, it'll draw uh, air through the grates and then through the tubes and then up the stack. You're going to fire up both machines? Yeah. Okay. That's our draft inducer. I'm going to make it over the side here. No. What is this? Well, you will have. Uh, this is a blower motor off of uh, an oil burner, and we use it to uh, pull the uh, air up to the grates. <laughs> okay. And then a draft. Oh, uh, it's the same principle over there. Yeah. Okay. These are what you call the keys to a steam engine. <laughs> and a match. Yes. Cooking here one of these times. So many people will fire these up fast, but it's no good. You should fire them slow so that all the metal in the boiler gets to expand at the same time. Okay. And with the flues, uh, they're steel flues surrounded by heavier steel. Uh, it's better to fire them up slow. Oh yeah. My grandfather okay. on my dad's side. And uh, yeah, I took quite a few trips with him in the cab of his locomotive. I'll be done. Yes. One big mistake I made was I didn't ask how to wear the gloves. I fired the engine once, but they didn't tell me to turn the gloves inside out. Oh, why? The seams give you blisters, then the blisters bleed, bleed, and then at the end of the day, to
to get the gloves off, you have to soak them in water to soften the dried blood inside those gloves. <laughs> You're making me shake the camera. <laughs> Them darn things were hungry. No one else in my family is interested in trains. Uh, I'm the only one. Oh, that's too bad. Yes. Now, the man that we got the equipment from, he said it was time for it to find a new home. He's the son of the man who built them, and he's 92. Oh, oh my goodness. Yes. And uh, very interesting. This, his dad built all of this stuff. Oh, really? Yes. He I'll was into there. boiler making and machining. Built the big engine, this one, the Hiawatha. Huh. So he said it was time for him to find a new home. Uh, this is the ring rail for our turntable, which we're going to apply about in this area. And the mechanism will be spinning on. And over here you'll have the turntable itself. It's upside down, but the table goes on that. You can drive your engines onto that. You can turn it any way you want. And head back the other way if you want. And what is this, the beam now, this big beam? This is the turntable itself. It's, okay. up, it's upside down right now, but we're going to put rails in it. And uh, that will spin around, all the way around. On top of that big on iron of, ring on there. On top of the ring rail. That's the steam gauge. And it ain't moving yet. <laughs> how, Roy, how long have you been at this train hobby with these trains? Or have you had other trains before this? The the first rails were put in in 1970. Which train did you have then? I had an Ottawa. Uh, quite popular with the amusement parks. It ran in the uh, General Motors Park at Alexandria, Indiana. When they upgraded, they gave it to this international dealer and I bought it from him, brought it up here, and when we got the rails completed, we ran it for about three years. Was it steam trained? Yes, steam, and it burned coal. Oh. So right now, as we speak, there's a new boiler being built for it. The, uh, Where is that train today? Where is the train? Uh, it's, it's in the shop. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that green car is actually belongs to that train. There were five cars with it. And on the side of each car was the name of an automobile. Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Cadillac, Chevrolet, Buick. And But the fellow who got it from General Motors, he painted over all of that stuff. We're going to try to re renew it. Now, is there a different kind of furnace to burn coal than wood? Uh, the grates are basically the difference. Okay. These have got uh, a good wood burning type grate in them. Now, the little Ottawa, it has a bar grate. It's a coal type of grate. And uh, I've been building a, a train since 59. And maybe someday I'll get back to finishing it up. Do you have to have a license to run this? What kind of license do you have to have? Okay, I got it. State of Minnesota traction engineering license? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you have to renew it every five years? Nope. It's quite an expensive training process. Yep. And uh, 
Todd, we, we ran the Hiawatha for a year. Well, when spring rolled around, Todd says, I'd like to get my license. So we hit the books before we did work or after we did work. Then he went to the steam school at Roloff. Oh. And yeah. he got more training there and the boiler inspector called and said, if you can get enough people to stay, I'll come out this evening and give them their test. Well, 12 of them decided to stay. And <laughs> I made a, while we're waiting for the boiler inspector, I made a statement to Todd. I said, you fare well on that test. We'll go look at the big engine, which is this one. <laughs> that was an expensive statement. <laughs> he was second highest out of 12. So he really wanted that engine. Yeah, yes, I did. <laughs> and the boiler inspector, I knew him and I knew the teachers. They wondered why I was sitting back in the corner with a shotgun. <laughs> so he uh, he did quite well on that. Well, good. So yeah, it's better to to have it than wish you did. <laughs> and there's quite a bit in these things that you. You can't just take for granted. How'd you how'd you physically get it here? Because it's so much so heavy. Truck? That trailer, trailer that's behind that dump truck. Yep. How'd you get it on the trailer? Uh, the fella had a turntable. Oh. We got it off of the main run track onto the turntable, then turned the turntable to line up with that trailer and we put a panel track onto the trailer. What's a panel track? Right there. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, we've, we've loaded cars with that. We loaded the Hiawatha with that. Loaded, did we load that thing? Number seven. Yep, and the little engine. So as you need stuff, you, you build it. Did you just call the license in your hat a hobby license? Yes, a traction engineer's license. Okay. I don't know what traction means. Except for uh, the big steam tractors. Okay. Yes. Now you say they call it a hobby license? Yes. Is there a pressure steam limit you have to... No. This is, nope. this is something about 15 pounds. 15 pounds over. And you have to have these are high pressure. Anything over 50, 15 pounds is basically the limit for heating systems, like in homes, hotels, etc. Oh, is that right? I yes. Didn't know that. And above 15 pounds is considered high pressure. And these run at 125. They run 125 pounds. Yes, sir. Okay. Tips a little bit. Is it normal? We had to do that. Oh, the curve? Wait a minute. Wait, hold on a minute. My. Hang on. <laughs> Gotta get out of here. Our tracks are not perfectly level. And because they, they may dip a little here and dip a little there, the man. Don Johnson had these set too rigid and where there was a, a crooked rail or something they'd want to climb out of the gauge. Oh. So we we put a, a washer be, on the bolster to give it that flexibility so the trucks can follow the crooked rails. This is the oil, steam oil reservoir. This is the steam oil 
pump, which pumps it into the cylinders and other fittings on the engine. Okay. Like the oil in the car. Huh? Same as the oil in the car. Yes. Gets around all of it. But this is basically Western, I mean, Eastern paraffin base oil. It takes uh, the heat of the steam and everything. Is the, is the whole thing, this whole tank I'm looking at, steam or was it in compartments? What's, what, what do we have well, here? That whole thing is the boiler. The whole thing is the boiler? Yes. So how's the heat get in there from the wood fire? Is there a, a duct for it? Uh, there's flues inside the boiler drum. Okay. And you've got, it, you've got water walls around the firebox. And that firebox runs down here <clears throat> and inside there is where your fire is at okay and what's the rest of it then up here from this portion up to the front is the main drum with the flues in it and the fire heats the firebox there's usually an arch in there a fire arch so the fire's got to go up and around that arch then down through the flues, out in front, and it involves the superheaters with it. And what you're hearing is the uh, blower, which is, induces the draft. And where's the piston that the steam moves? Those units right here. Oh, these units right here, okay. Yes. Well, they look small. So the steam then pushes those shafts, and that turns the wheels. This section of the boiler in the front is called the smoke box, because that's where it gathers the smoke and blows it out through the stack. After the, it goes through the flues. This is the pressure so far we got so far? Yeah. 25 pounds? Yeah. Where do you control the when the car goes by? Where do you control the forward and reverse? Where's your controls for that? This here is called the Johnson level. This here is forward and this here is reverse. In the middle is neutral. What does that change that when you push that? That changes your mechanism down here for forward reverse. Oh, I see. Okay, hold on. All right. Yep. And this here will be, this here is the throttle. That's your throttle? Yep. And uh, the other side over here is the brake lever on the left. Got it. On the left. All right. What's the, what was the question? What, what's that chain for? This one here is a butterfly for the doors, so when you pull it, it's all mechanism. What's a butterfly? Uh, the doors. Oh, open the yep. heat firewood. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the water glass here is to determine where your water is in the boiler. And uh, it's at a good stage right now. And uh, you can have it a little higher, but you don't want it down low. These here, in case your water glass, uh, something happens, it plugs, you got your tricops, which you can open up and see it'll, uh, the steam or water will come out. Water, hopefully, that's, that tells you your water level in your boiler. Hmm. It's a backup. Yep, it's a backup system. 
I got 60 pounds of pressure, so you don't need the external air to. What's that lever for? Uh, this valve right here is an injector valve. It, it runs down, and you'll see the injector on the side of the engine. That, that brass piece down over oh, here. Got it. And uh, I turn the water on here from the turn the water on here from the uh, tender, okay. and that runs down through. Then I'll open up the valve and she'll pull water from there into the uh, boiler itself. Okay. And I have another one right there. On the other side. If the steam pressure gets too high, is there some kind of safety valve? Yeah, right here is uh, the safety valve. And uh, at 125 psi, she'll pop. And it'll run probably about. Uh, 15 seconds and that'll shut down. You say it'll shut down. What'll, what'll shut down? Uh, yes, it'll shut down. Oh, okay. Down. Just releases enough steam to bring the pressure down. Now what's what's the blow around for? Uh, to clean the mud ring at the uh, base of the. You, you call that mud ring? Yeah. Why is, mud? Because uh, there's sediment that builds up in the. Oh, okay. From the water or what? Yeah. And that's that's how you. That cleans that. Let me let me step points. back then. Okay. So you don't leave it on very long then? No. Just enough to clean it out? Yes. See, you took off the smokestack, you must be getting some pressure. Yes.
a handsome fellow. <laughs> How much water does it take to make a trip around? Uh, probably about uh, 55 gallons. Not one trip? Well, just to fill the tender. Uh, one trip around, we haven't really traded that out yet.
Okay. What you just seen here was a safety valve going off at 126 pounds uh, PSI. And it's, it is supposed to do this to uh, uh, secure the uh, boiler from exploding or overpressure. 